Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to the Gospel of Matthew, that 27th chapter. Matthew chapter 27, and uh, hold your place right there, if you will, for a few minutes. Uh, we are in the fourth of the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. We started out with the hope of his pardon. When he looked at the thief and he said, today, uh, well, that was the hope of promise. The pardon was he looked down from the cross and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then the hope of his promise when he looked at the thief hanging near him and said, today, uh, you'll be with me uh, in paradise. And then we looked at the hope of his passion and he looked down at the foot of the cross and he took care of his mother and uh, committed her to uh, the closest friend that he had here on this earth in John. And today I, I, I've actually changed the title just a little bit. Uh, I had the hope of his propitiation. Uh, that's a big old churchy word. And I've kind of replaced it with another P word and just the hope of his punishment, the hope of his uh, punishment. So stand with me, if you will, and let's begin reading in verse 45. We'll only read a couple of verses of Matthew 27. Now from the sixth hour, which is uh, noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. From noon until three o'clock, we do not know um, really how God did that. Was it a cloud? Was it a storm? Was it an eclipse? Uh, we have no idea. Josephus, though, writing from, I believe it was Egypt, uh, wrote of this day, of the darkness that had covered the earth. Um, and about the ninth hour, three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, the darkness there is the Greek word skotos. It means obscurity. Uh, in the midst of the darkness, Jesus cried screamed with a loud voice. My God, my God, can you just hear it in the midst of the dark so thick you could cut it. Couldn't see him, but you heard him. Why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you let go of me? Why have you deserted me? Any of you ever been abandoned? I suspect some of you have. I suspect some of you had a husband to abandon you. I suspect some of you had a wife to abandon you. Some of you may, like me, have had some parents somewhere along the way that abandoned you. I, I want to tell you something. It's one of the most horrible feelings that anybody will ever experience in their life. That somebody would reject you, let go of you, desert you, throw you off to the side. There's no feeling like that that I've ever experienced. I, I can't imagine the sensation of being abandoned by my heavenly father. But he cried and screamed, why have you done that? Let's pray. Father, touch us with thy presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Uh, please be seated. I read this week where a mother abandoned her three-year-old daughter in Las Vegas. I read this week where Another mother abandoned her four-year-old in New York City, in the Bronx. 
in 24 hours, Jesus has been abandoned, first of all, by Judas, although predicted, although he knew it was coming. He begged him not to, but he did anyway. He was abandoned by his half-brothers and sisters who never really believed in him until after the resurrection. He was abandoned by the disciples that he had invested three years into their life, pouring into them, telling them uh, basically what was going to happen. But they were nowhere to be found. And now God, was it not enough that Judas, was it not enough that my family, was it not enough for my friends? And now you, God, you have abandoned me. Why? Have you turned your back on me? What in the world was going on on that cross? What in the world was he facing, hanging there, suspended between heaven and earth? What was going on that the heavenly father turned his back on his only begotten son? Uh, Let me give you three things, beginning first of all with the exchange. You understand that while Jesus was hanging there on the cross, he took the punishment for everything that you and I will ever do wrong while we're here on this earth. He took your shame. He took your guilt. He took your place and the punishment for your sin and did the same for me. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2 The Bible says he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. God poured all of the sins of all of mankind for all of eternity on the Lord Jesus himself and there he died as your substitute in his mind. That should have been us on that cross. But he substituted, he exchanged himself for you and for me. That little word, atoning sacrifice, it means payment for damages that have been done. On the way to lunch just this week, I looked in my rear view member and there was one of our staff members standing in the street. And uh, a young man had... uh, I don't know, accidentally sideswiped him and ultimately drove off in a hit and run. A little while later, he finally shows back up and assumes responsibility. And that young man now is liable for the damages done to that vehicle. Uh, That's what this atoning sacrifice is all about. In other words, uh, it would be as somebody paying this young man for the damages that he incurred on somebody else's car. It's payback for our sins. But not just ours, the Bible says, the sins for the whole world. Now, how does that happen? Paul writing to the church at Corinth in that second letter in the fifth chapter in the 21st verse says, for He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now before we leave this morning, I want to give us two things. Uh, First of all, uh, I want to talk about the explanation of all of this and then the expectation from God. All of this. What is the explanation behind it? Well, let me give you this. First of all, we've got to come to the conclusion that the Savior is holy. Can you say that word holy? The Savior is holy. Revelation chapter 4, verse 8 Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, when I was at Furman University a number of years ago, uh, one of the things that I had to take was a a Greek class. And we studied all of the Greek and the Roman gods. 
Uh, we looked at Jupiter and Aphrodite and Zeus and many, many more. And one of the things that you find out about those gods is that they were frail. Uh, they were broken. Uh, they had lots and lots of imperfections and uh, corruptions about them. But let me just tell you today, Jehovah God is incorruptible. Jehovah God is holy. Jehovah God is perfect. Now because he is holy, he cannot participate in anything that is unholy. Now I'm going to use some strong language today. Uh, maybe that you don't even use in the confines of your family and home, but I, I will say it anyway. God hates evil. He can't stand evil. He's perfect. He is holy. He is righteous. And he cannot look on that which has been corrupted. He cannot look on that uh, which has turned into evil. Why? Because he is pure perfection. Habakkuk chapter number 1 and verse 13, the Bible says your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Understand, that's why that there is no sin, there's no evil uh, in heaven. So when Jesus went to the cross, when they nailed him there, he became the sin of the world. This God-man, as we know him, became sin who knew no sin. It is amazing to me, listen to this, that every sin known to mankind, he took on himself there on Calvary. Child molestation. Child slavery. He became sin. Every lie, every betrayal, the murder of six million Jews at the Holocaust, all of your sins, all of my sins, every evil was on himself there on that cross. Mind-boggling to think about, isn't it? And at that moment, when he became sin, God could no longer look God could no longer view. God could no longer cast his gaze on his son. And as soon as God turned his back on his son, Jesus cried, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. God, why have you turned your back on me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? What happened at that moment? The relationship that at, up until this time was perfect, was in complete harmony and unity, glued together by love. At that moment when Jesus became sin and a holy God could no longer look at sin and turned his back, that relationship was broken. Bam! God's holiness stepped back. I can't look, and Jesus screams. Why? Because God is holy. Second, sin is horrific. Sin is ugly. Sin is nasty. Now, here's the deal. We think it's cool. We do. We think sin is just cool. Hollywood has uh, made sin look attractive. You ever watch the beer commercials on television? Everybody is anxious when the Super Bowl commercials come out just to see how glamorous Hollywood has conveyed sin. Problem is Hollywood doesn't show you the backside. They don't show you the guy becoming an alcoholic and then abusing his wife physically. He doesn't show you the wino in the gutter throwing up and lying in his own vomit. Hollywood says, well, you're a stick in the mud if you don't participate with us. You're a fuddy-duddy if you don't participate. 
sin has a predication about it that uh, if God hates it, then we've got to learn to laugh at it. And Satan has de designed and devised his plan uh, to help us to drop down our defenses. And in order to do that, uh, he makes it funny. He gets us to laughing at sin. And if we can laugh at sin, then our defenses then come down. I'll never forget uh, one of the major transitions in our culture occurred when Three's Company uh, came on and we began to laugh at sin. Will and Grace, we laughed at sin. And when we started laughing, all of a sudden it becomes more palatable and more acceptable and we drop our guard and our defenses are let down. But he never shows us the consequences. Those James Bond movies that everybody enjoys where James Bond goes from one woman to the other woman to this woman to that woman. But it doesn't show in the movies the heartbreak and the devastation and the STDs and all of that other stuff. It's just laughter and palatability. If you want to see sin's true consequences, folks, all you've got to do is to look at the cross. Look at the price that Jesus paid. Let me talk to you just a second about the damaging effects of sin. First of all, sin alienates. Just look what happened. Sin separated the Son of God from God uh, the Father. Where in the world does that happen? It, it happens when sin gets in and estranges us uh, from God. Listen to Isaiah 59 too. Your evil has separated you from your God and your sins have caused him to turn away from you. How many of you uh, have at some point and at some time uh, in your life uh, uh, got on your knees somewhere and you started praying and seeking God and it was as if your prayers never got beyond the ceiling and it just stuck right there and you're wondering what in the world could it be? that the reason your prayers are not getting through to the Father is that there is some unconfessed sin going on in your life that you fail to acknowledge and fail to recognize and fail to repent of and it clogs up and it separates you and your relationship with God. Just your fellowship, not, not, not necessarily your relationship, but your fellowship with God. Well, I'm going to tell you, I've been married for 51 years. I, I don't have to have anybody to tell me when my wife gets mad at me. Her, her body language, she just shuts up. She won't talk to me. Doesn't happen often. Oh, but I, I, I don't have to wonder. And you know what? As a child of God, neither will you. You'll know when that fellowship uh, has been broken because sin alienates, but sin also agonizes. Look at the agony that Jesus was going through. Why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me out here all alone? May, may I say something to everybody that is watching by live stream and television and those of you that are here? You are not made to live in conflict with God. You're not made to live in conflict with God. And when you give in to sin and temptation, all kinds of agonies take place when that fellowship is broken between you and God and then sin attacks. Sin alienates, sin agonizes, and sin attacks. Look at how sin attacked Jesus. It alienated him from his heavenly father. He is there crying out uh, in agony. I, I want you to understand when you violate the principles, the precepts, and the law of God, there is always going to be a penalty to be paid. God is a righteous, listen to this, God is a righteous, what does that mean? That he always does right? God is a righteous judge. He's always right. He's always fair. Unlike me, um, unfortunately, I misjudge people all of the time. Uh, I, I was uh, 
uh, talking to somebody just the other day and uh, I thought, well, I've got, I've got this person figured out and I turned out to be all wrong. I mean, I wasn't even close. But God's always fair. God is always right. He's always true. We, we like to talk about, and here, boy, this is one of the things that is happening so strongly in the Christian community today. We love to talk about the fact that God is love. But I want to hear, listen to me carefully. Yes, God is love, but God is also a God of justice. And I'm grateful for that, and you ought to be grateful for that. That, that he's a righteous judge. If, if that were not true, it would mean that evil would perpetuate all over the place and would go unpunished. I don't want evil to go unpunished. Wouldn't it be terrible if the Hitlers of this world were to go unpunished? It would mean that you could go out here and do anything that you want to do, be as mean as you want to be, be as destructive as you want to be, be as wicked as you want to be, and never be held accountable for it. But God is a righteous judge. God hates evil, and you ought to, too. I hate the thoughts, much less the actions of child abuse. God hates it when a uh, woman is sexually assaulted and an innocent woman is raped. God hates it when these folks are kidnapping young children and selling them into sex slavery and human trafficking. God hates that. We ought to hate that. By the way, if you don't, then you really don't love. If you want to see a side of me maybe that you've never seen before, <laughs> you come against one of my grandkids. Hmm? You, you do something to my wife. You attack my family in some fashion or another. And uh, you're going to see a side maybe that nobody's ever seen before. Why is that? Uh, because righteous anger cares about the needs of other people. And there's some things that you need to be angry about. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Wages, that which you have earned. Eternal life is a gift from God. And Jesus said, I am going to pay your wages. I am going to pay for the penalty of your sin. I'm going to handle that. Do you know what the biggest problem that you have in your life today? You know what it is? You say, man, I want to tell you, my biggest problem is my finances right now. Now, that's not your biggest problem. It may be a problem, but it's not your biggest problem. Some of you say, the biggest problem that I'm facing right now is uh, I'm, I'm in the midst of a health crisis. That is a huge problem, and, and, and I hate that, but that's not your biggest problem. Somebody says, uh, the biggest problem I have is that I got fired from my job and, or my job played out, and I don't have a place to work and earn. That's a big deal, but it's not the biggest problem that you have. You know what the biggest problem you have? You're at war with God. You say, I'm not at war with God. Yeah, you are. Because every day you wake up and you decide that day who's going to run your life. You decide that morning what kind of choices that you're going to make as to what's best for you on that given day. And you know what God says, but you come to the conclusion, yes, God, I know that this is the direction I need to go in. I know that this is a decision that I need to make that will bring more glory and honor to you. But the fact of the matter is, God, I think I know what makes me happier than you do. And so you make decisions that you know that are opposite of what God wants you to do, and it puts you at war with God. The Savior is holy. Sin is horrific. And salvation is high priced. Salvation is high priced. It costs God his son. It costs Jesus his life. 
Yeah, the Bible says it is salvation is a gift of God. That is true. But somebody had to pay the price for that gift. Somebody had to pay the sin debt. Salvation is free, but that ticket had to be purchased by someone, and it was by Jesus. Listen to the scripture in Romans 3, 25. God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to satisfy God's anger against us. We are made right with God when we believe that Jesus shed his blood, sacrificing, substituting, being punished for us. I read something very interestingly this week by another preacher and it's an illustration that I have heard before and probably you've heard it too about two young men that grew up together and they went to law school together. They graduated, got their law degree. One of them went on to become a federal court judge and the other one got addicted to cocaine and went into a life of drugs. Sometime after that, the drug addict was convicted of fraud and had to go before that. Guess what? You've got it. You know about it. You see where it's going. And he had to stand before his friend who had become the court judge. And everybody thought, huh, we know about this relationship. We know where this is going. Uh, th th this old boy is going to get off scot-free. But instead, when the evidence came out, and the prosecutor and the defense attorney were done, the judge rendered the most penalizing verdict under law that he could give. Uh, he instituted the biggest fine for this guy to pay. And he then evoked the greatest sentence on him under law that could have been given. And when he had done that and he slammed the gavel down, he stood up from behind that sacred desk and went down and stood, took off of his robe and then paid that boy's debt in full. Justice and mercy, all in the same swoop. And that's what Jesus did for you. And that's what he did for me. The sentence of death was pronounced and Jesus paid the price for your sins and for mine. Y'all ever heard the term settled out of court? Have you? <laughs> Some of you look at you. Uh, been there. <laughs> it's a pretty good thing, isn't it? It means that you don't have to go stand before the judge and the jury. Uh, it, it means that uh, you, you probably don't have to pay uh, as large a fine uh, as you would have had to pay. Do you know that that's what Jesus did for you and that's what he did for me? He settled our case out of court. He was the judge. He was the jury. He's the prosecutor and he's the defense attorney. He pronounced the judgment and the penalty for your sins and mine. And then he took it on himself and settled our case out of court. That's what Jesus did. That's what all of this means. Listen to what it says in Galatians 3.13. Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. Now let me give you the expectation, okay? Uh, the first thing I want you to see with me is that we are expected to repent, to turn from Jesus or turn from sin and turn to Jesus. Uh, I, I gave, uh, had a funeral yesterday, a homegoing celebration uh, over at Heritage Funeral Home. And you talk about an eclectic group of people like I've never seen in a very long time. And uh, I knew God was about to do something wonderful and the place was full and packed and standing room only and best as I could tell, there were probably about that many people outside who could not get inside. And I just preached the gospel, gave an invitation and 24 people received Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. They, they knew what the expectation uh, really was. And, and my point is everybody is saved the same way. There's only one way and his name is Jesus and there's no other way to get to heaven. 
Uh, the Bible says we are made right in God's sight when we trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we all can be saved in the same way no matter who we are or what we have done. Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. But by the way, can I just say this? Listen closely. Jesus also paid the sin debt for that sin that you're hanging on to right now in the closet of your life that you think that nobody else knows about, that you think that you've got to hold on to that. Can I say Jesus paid that sin debt as well? The Bible says if we deliberately, listen, listen, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there is no sacrifice for our sin that is left. What does that mean? That means that you sit and you listened to the gospel of Jesus. You listened to God's plan of salvation and you turn your back on that opportunity. The Bible says there is no alternative. There's no plan B. There's no other way. There remains no more sacrifice for that sin. In other words, if you don't come to Jesus by this method, you don't have a half a hallelujah chance of ever finding anything else to get to. Then the second thing is not only repent, but rejoice. Um, Romans chapter 5 verse 11, now we can rejoice in a wonderful new relationship with God all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in making us friends of God. How can anybody not rejoice at what Jesus did for us on Calvary's cross? How could anyone not turn away from sin, place their faith in Jesus, knowing what this man has done for us? How, how could anybody not rejoice in the fact that all of their sins have been forgiven and their names written in the Lamb's book of life? How could anyone not be happy about what God has done for us through his son Jesus. Amen. And then finally, you got to remember what sin costs Jesus when you're faced with temptation. Now, the fact of the matter is, everybody under the sound of my voice right now faces temptation in their life. Can I get an amen from you? All face temptations, every one of us. When you find yourself being confronted with temptation, that's the time right then, right there, that you hit the pause button. And you say, now wait a minute. If I yield to this, if I give in to this, if I say yes to this, if I fall into this, that's what nailed Jesus to the cross. That's why he died. Oh, what a deterrent to sin that will be when you're tempted to be mean-spirited in your family, when you're tempted to be selfish, when you're tempted to sin. It's not something to laugh about. It's something to remind yourself Jesus died for this. Listen to this in 1 Peter 1. God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. The ransom he paid was not with gold or silver. He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Now, you say, Pastor, listen, I've already repented. I, I have received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And I do rejoice in the fact that God has saved me from a life of sin. And, and I remember, I, I'm, when I'm tempted, I, I, know what, I know what all of that means. Well, let me ask you about this last one. Do you relay that message to others? I, I can't imagine for one minute, I just can't imagine why anybody would want to keep their relationship with Jesus a secret. Why, why do you want to? Hold on to that. Well, it's just so personal. Baloney. We're under a mandate from God to go. And as we are going, we're to tell others about what Jesus Christ has done for us. I, I, I want to ask you a question. If somebody down here on this earth died for you, 
Would you hold on to that? Would you keep that a secret? Or would you go around saying, do you know, old brother John, John gave up his life so I could live. The only reason I'm here is because of what John did for me. The only reason I'm alive is because of what Alice did for me. The only reason that I'm here is because I should have been the one that died. And they took my, we broadcast it across the face of this earth. Jesus did that for you. Why not tell others and relay that message? So let me just ask you, who is your one? Who is that one person that you're praying for? Who is that one person that you want to see come to Jesus in 2021? Who is that one person that you're dedicated to pray for and look for opportunities to share your story with? You say, why are you doing that? Well, who's your one stuff, preacher? You just want a bigger church? No. You want to know why we keep building buildings and adding more ministries? You want to know why we buy up more property? It's because Jesus loves people. And we're commanded to reach them with the gospel. I hesitated to put this in my notes because it sounds a little harsh and I don't really mean for it to, but you know, I don't believe this is true of First Baptist Indian Trail, but I do believe it's true of a lot of churches all around us. You know what a church that doesn't want to grow, listen, do you, know, do, you, do you know what a church that doesn't want to grow and reach people is saying? It's saying to the people in their own community, go ahead and die and go to hell. That's what they're saying. We do it because Christ died and he died for people. How many of you went from last Sunday and you left here and you did something good for somebody else? Don't raise your hand. I really don't want you to do that. But how many of you took that challenge? How many of you took uh, that encouragement and, and you went out and you found somebody to just do something good for that week. How many of you are lining up that person to bring with you on Easter Sunday morning to hear the gospel? Some of you, by way of television and internet and many of you that are here, uh, you, you're like many of those that were in that homegoing celebration yesterday. Uh, you don't have a place where Jesus Christ became real to you and you confessed your sins and you received him into your heart and into your life. Uh, I want to challenge you right today, right where you are, whether you're here in the room or whether you are uh, watching my live stream, uh, why not right where you are, just whisper a prayer and thank Jesus for dying on that cross for you. Ask him to forgive you of your sin and receive him into your heart and your life. Commit to him that you're going to serve him with his help for the rest of your life. Why wouldn't you do that when you realize that he took your place on that cross? That should have been you. And he paid your sin debt. And had it not been for what he did on Calvary, you'd spend eternity in hell. Would you bow with me and let's pray together? How many of you would pray this prayer with me and really mean it? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross. I believe that Jesus paid my sin debt. That should have been me on that cross. Please forgive me of all my sin. And I receive you into my heart right now. Save my soul. Change my life. Help me to live for you as long as I live. Now, Father, I thank you for those that prayed that prayer with me. I thank you that you're a God of your word. You're a good, good God. You keep your word. You say if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just 
to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Thank you for saving souls today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.